This is Tommy's Outdoors 127, and today is the sixth and the last episode that concludes a series of episodes dedicated to Marpam project. Today we are going to talk about seabird tracking and monitoring. Big crowd on the podcast, four guests plus your truly, so five people. It's a record for the for this podcast. And I am sure you will enjoy it. It's very interesting. And this is a short introduction today. Just know that I launched a l- newsletter. Yes, Tommy's Outdoors newsletter. The link is in the d- description of the show. So go in there and subscribe to my newsletter. And as this is the best way to be notified about all the new episodes of the podcast, as well as blogs, articles, book reviews, and other New, upcoming, and exciting content from Tommy Saldor. So, Tommy Saldor's newsletter, link in the description of the show. Um, yeah, subscribe. You won't regret it. If you enjoy this podcast, you will enjoy this newsletter. And that's it. Now to the episode. Wow, huge crowd today. Welcome to Tommy Saldor's. Thank Hello, you. afternoon, Tommy. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. It's it's, it's like I said uh, before we started the recording. This show is probably the most people you ever had on the show, and we are going to talk about seabirds uh, again, work package. But I think that the only fur thing is to start with a round of introductions. My name is Catherine Beth Jones. I am the senior research ecologist for the BTO in Northern Ireland. Um, as part of that work, I also am the Northern Ireland Seabird Coordinator. So I. Um, coordinate counts of uh, seabirds around the coast of Northern Ireland um, from volunteers and from environmental NGOs um, and write the annual Northern Ireland Seabird Report. As part of this, I was um, leading a work package for MARPAM um, that aimed to uh, fill um, abundance um, gaps for seabirds on Rathlin Island, which is Northern Ireland's most important seabird colony, and uh, along the north coast, which also has big cliffs that are difficult to count. Hi, I'm Jacob Davis. I'm a research ecologist at the British West for Ornithology as well um, in the Wetland and Marine team. I'm based in Scotland. I mostly do data analysis. Um, on this project, I was tasked with creating the future projections of seabird abundance that um, informed climate change vulnerability assessment for seabirds. Yeah, hello, I'm Daniel Johnston. I'm a, I'm a research ecologist uh, based in um, BTO Scotland, uh, and I work on a range of things, including mostly based uh, with regards to seabird research, but I look at seabird ecology as well as uh, look at seabird interactions with uh, offshore marine renewables. And my name's Kendrew Cahoon. I have uh, been working both for AFBE and Birdwatch Ireland during the course of the project. And during the phase that uh, working for both parties, whenever the this uh, BTO contract uh, was undertaken, folks, can you tell us a little bit more about the whole work package and how it feeds into the uh, entire Marpam project? Uh, sure, I can go first. Um, so, uh, the Marine Protected Areas Management Monitoring Program uh, is this cross-border project that aims to develop tools for monitoring. Um, protected coastal marine environments um, in Western Scotland, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, which make up this Interreg 5A region. Um, So part of that um, work is to um, address gaps um, and to to model uh, seabed abundance changes um, due to climate change and um, try and address some of the sort of ecological gaps for that to inform those um, marine protected areas. so part of the work I was doing was part of the seabird package um, and it really aimed to address that sort of fundamental information that we need um, for developing and managing marine protected areas, which is what have we got in, in our marine coastal um, habitats. So um, I guess um, you don't know what you've got till it's gone and um, we really want to try and avoid that situation by really cataloguing um, in detail, what what we have now and how that's changed through time, and then and then um, scientists like Jacob can then go on and use that information to to look at how we might how those things might change in the future. So um, a really important part of that MARPAM work package was just to fill monitoring gaps in Northern Ireland. So in particular, Rathlin Island, which is Northern Ireland's largest seabird colony. Um, is very, um, very difficult to survey, as Kendra will be able to attest to. Um, It has about 30 kilometres of coastline. The cliffs could be up to 100 metres tall. And it has 
over 100,000 um, seabirds nesting on it, um, which we found out during the council last year. Um, and it requires both land-based and sea-based monitoring, which means that um, it is pretty much impossible to do as a volunteer. So a lot of the seabird data that we get for Northern Ireland is collected by volunteers. But for big, challenging sites like Rathlin Island, um, you really need um, professional professional effort and, and money to fund boats and that kind of thing. So uh, Rathlin had been a monitoring gap in Northern Ireland, so we didn't know, we didn't have up-to-date figures about what was there. Um, and same goes for that north coast stretch kind of opposite Rathlin on the north coast of Antrim there. Uh, where there was also big cliffs. It's not quite as an important area for seabirds in, in that stretch, but it was still a gap. So we, we needed um, the Marpan project to kind of step in to, to provide a resource that we could use to collect data for those. So um, that was um, that part of the work package that, that I was working on there. And then I guess from that, it goes on to the work that Daniel and, and Jacob were involved in, which looks at different aspects of uh, seabird uh, ecology. Um, and what we don't know and what we need to know about those. Yeah, so um, so I was working, uh, as Catherine said, on the on the climate change aspects. And so um, there was actually there was actually part of a wider team working on the, the climate change aspects of, of this. So um, with with Daniel at BTO, other other colleagues at BTO and RSPB. And so the I suppose an overview of, of that of that work that that lot was to carry out a literature review um, of, of mechanisms by which uh, climate change may affect seabirds or which seabirds um, uh, are, are currently sensitive to climate um, so there's that then there's um, modeling climate changes impacts on seabirds in the future so taking what we know about how um, you know fitting models between the relation the relationship between seabird abundance and climate and then projecting that into the future to say okay what 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 do we expect seabird abundance in the interreg 5a area to be in 2050 colleagues at um rspb were also modeling um the at sea distributions of a, a, a restricted set of species over the same time scale and then all of these aspects come together to um, uh, inform a climate change vulnerability assessment. Um, and then in, in combination with uh, the climate change vulnerability assessment, you've got site level information, um, species fact sheets kind of describing what we expect each species to do. Um, and then on, on the basis of that, um, a set of species and habitat adaptation options were created. So how can we help species adapt to climate change? And then all of these things came together to, um, I guess, be a bit of a kind of one-stop shop for people that are interested in seabird conservation and climate change um, in the Interreg VA, uh, 5A area. Um, yeah, so that's that's the work I was involved in. Sorry, I think I probably tr trod on Daniel's toes for some of the climate change stuff there. All right. Well, yeah, Jacob gave a very good overview of the climate change work. I contribute to that through the literature review aspect, which was sort of the very start of the process. Um, and that was really reviewing what had been done previously to look at climate change impacts on seabirds and the mechanisms by which uh, climate change affect seabirds and then relate that research to the MARPAM Interreg 5A region um, which is specifically <clears throat> on the west of Scotland and uh, the Irish Sea area in Northern Ireland. Um, so that was my work with regards to climate change stuff and also contributed to uh, Lot 4 which was the Black Guillemot work <clears throat> and that's more uh, directly sort of gathering data to examine seabird use in relation to uh, marine protected areas. So black guillemots are non-migratory, um, which means they do not qualify for um, marine pro uh, for special protected area protection. Um, so my, uh, I had kind of two roles in this. One was, um, as Catherine says, helping out uh, uh, with some of the actual on the ground work that uh, you know we're not we're not a voice with bird capable bird professionals here uh, in Northern Ireland so 
Um, so at times we need to all pull together and help each other out. And, and I was able to wear my professional hat uh, through the project to help deliver uh, the, the project and, and formed one of the bodies to help Catherine get the, that big, massive seabird colony uh, of Rathlin Island counted. Uh, which is a, a big beast of an operation. And then the second, and really important though for, for the deliverable, and then the second uh, part I played in the role was a, a slightly more passive, uh, which was kind of helping uh, my AFB colleagues who lead the overall Mar Marpan project uh, uh, some oversight and steer on all of the project packages, including the BTOs bits. So um, both general and troop, I suppose. At some point, uh, folks, the the question that jumps at me is like it, it's this this what you describe sounds incredibly interesting, even for just people you know just interested in birds and and in ecology. Is the results of your your service and the results of your work available, or is it going to be available anywhere you know uh, publicly, full stop, as a publication and so on? And then follow up question. Is it going to be available uh, in a form digestible for the layman who maybe not necessarily um, can can go through the scientific papers with graphs and description of the you know method used, but is interested in you know abundance of birds and how it's going to look in 20, 20, 2050 and you know how we can help in climate change and so on. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the. Seabird survey work from um, Northern Ireland being published. It should be out there soon. I've seen some sort of final drafts of that, so it should be should be available on Marpam's website fairly shortly. Um, one of the really important things that um, the field team, Kendrew and and colleagues, did um, last year was develop a count manual for Rathlin. So I mentioned earlier that Rathlin is really really um, difficult place to study study uh, to survey seabirds. So um, and the periodicity of uh, censuses is very long, so they only happen every 20 years or so, which means that, you know, the people who surveyed it this time might not be available to serve it next time. So to be able to get good continuous um, and comparable data from Rathum, um, the team put together a count manual, which will also be available online um, to help the future uh, seabird surveyors um, get consistent um, information that we can then compare in the future to what was what was collected last year, so that's really valuable. Um, and for the layperson, um, well, there are layperson's um, summaries available for all of the seabird work the BTO has been doing, and um, we're also um, quite keen to get make those really accessible in terms of more sort of friendly accounts. So there'll be a series of blogs um, produced by the BTO on on the work that we've been doing for Marpam, so they should be um, something to look out for as well. Right, so Marpam website is a uh, is a place to go. Right, Definitely. obviously in the show notes and the and links in the description of this show. So everyone, anyone interested should go there. Uh, I, I suppose for the for the climate change stuff, it's you know uh, as Catherine said, it'll be on the on the website. We're also kind of taking what we've um, found so far and and running with it a bit. So digging into the relationships that we've estimated between seabird abundance and climate and um, trying to see whether those are the relationships we'd expect, given what we know um, about from other studies about mechanisms by which seabirds might be sensitive to climate, and also saying, say, uh, is it water column feeders that, are, we, ex that we find to be more, um, you know, that have a stronger relationship with oceanographic variables like sea surface temperature, things like that, um, and so we're, we're yeah we're, we're going to be writing that up well we are writing that up as a, a paper at the moment um and yeah all of the, the climate change work is on the marpan website and we're you know doing blogs and case studies and conferences and this sort of thing so hopefully it gets out there uh yeah i mean for a lot of this stuff we are trying to produce the the work into pass it through peer review into journal form as well so um watch that space but that that works out ongoing and will be ongoing for a while it's really it, it's really important in these projects to uh make sure that all the audiences are hit so you know as we know that not everyone's going to see a peer-reviewed paper or read it that daniel writes much as it's it's it'll be fascinating uh and 
Uh, one reason is, of course, that not a, that's not available to everybody, and also it, it's quite specialised. And finally, it'll only not because Daniel's slow; it's because of the processes and and ridiculous uh, to get a, something from fieldwork to a publication, even if you're fast. Um, so it's really important, though, for the other. There is a communications thread within. Uh, a, a, I think it's, a, it's actually a work package, I think, in itself, and uh, Marpam to communicate all of these pieces of work. And obviously, you know, there, this work was done under contract, but it's BTO work, uh, uh, and there's a role of Marpam to publicise the BTO work and vice versa, and to make sure that this stuff reaches the audiences. You know, the people who are walking down to Bangor Marina in Northern Ireland see these little black and white birds on top of their... On top of their um, uh, the the walls and the piers and so on. They need to know how they have responsibility to look after them. They're fascinating creatures. Uh, look at uh, look after their nesting sites, minimise disturbance and so on. And the general public are fascinated with this stuff, and they're also equally fascinated. You know, thinking about the the that you know whenever things get big and difficult, they're interested in things like like how how on earth you count, you know. 10,000 guillemots in the bottom of a stack, top of a sea stack or whatever. Um, so it's really important that we get those messages out. And, and I know there's good work being done through story maps and through the website. And there'll be lots more to come on that over the next uh, few months. I, I absolutely agree with you, Kendra. And um, it was so when we were working on, on the black guillemot tracking, um, I think perhaps it would be fun if. Daniel could talk about talking to to people in Bangor about what we were doing, um, trying to <laughs> trying to catch guillemots on on in their harbour because it was it was we had a funny spectrum of reactions from people uh, doing that work. It was it was fun. Yeah, um, usually, well, what I sort of tracked me into seabird work was going to these remote islands and getting to sort of wild and wind scarred places to work, but. Uh, the, the Black Gilmore work was a, sort of the first time brought me into an urban area and with Bangor. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, trying to sort of um, catch the the birds to ta tag them um, without causing too much disturbance, well, disturbance to the birds, but also attracting too much attention to ourselves. Um, <laughs> but inevitably, it's a, a popular area, area and eyebrows were raised and... Uh, <clears throat> we were approached a couple times by people just wondering what we were up to and generally the reactions were of ge genuine interest um, and also a great affection to the birds themselves and yeah that <clears throat> going like that's a great way to sort of educate people on things they see every day but don't really think about um, especially to, to, to me black elmas are quite an exotic species but people in Bangor they see them all the time and don't really maybe not <clears throat> they might just see them next to like pigeons or uh, other sort of urban birds that they wouldn't think twice about. Not to say anything against pigeons themselves, <clears throat> but actually the black guillemots have incredibly interesting sort of foraging behaviors and they they go out to sea and they can, um, to, to interesting spots and they're little explorers in themselves. <clears throat> they're not just hanging around the, the harbor all the time. They sit. So it was quite uh, fun to sort of, introduce the bird to people who see them all the time and have always wondered about them, but not really um, thought too much about it. So yeah, it's a, just generally interacting with the public is a perfect way to do it. Um, as long as they're not calling the police on me, then <laughs> I, that's, <laughs> that was, that's my, know. that's my question. Did you, did you have any, any sort of a kind of hostile, uh, you know, oh, you're disturbing birds or you're catching those birds and whatever. Surprise. I was surprised that I didn't actually people in Bangor were really really lovely oh, the police were informed of our activities so hopefully we got away with, got away with it um okay but <laughs> there was a got away with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was a group of uh a group of people who um <clears throat> were kindly enough kindly enough to wait till I'd finished sort of trying to catch this bird and then we said right what are you up to cuz I did look pretty dodgy at the time but it, i think they were quite surprised when i gave them such a long <laughs> spiel about marine protected areas they weren't expecting that so uh, 
<laughs> they were expecting you some sort of a thug that's just, just gonna catch and torture a little bird and you were like yeah this is like bird yeah you know i i gotta ask you a question about bird tagging because i was um and this is like in general to 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 all of you uh so so all of you feel free to chime in uh because i was no more than in more than one conversation about bird tagging and uh, the opinions are uh, at very least divided. Um, there is a lot of people in, uh, who, you know, on one hand appreciate the value of uh, gathering data, but on the other hand, it's, you know, argument of, oh, you're messing with their brain or, you know, that bird, um, especially when you see like, you know, big majestic birds like eagles with these massive wing tags is like, oh, you know, so there is these, this notion, like on one hand, you kind of like taking away from their wildness because they have these tags. And then it's like, oh, you know, is it really necessary? Is it not, you know, uh, causing any obstruction to the bird? Or for example, when the ducks are tagged with the, with the nose saddle or big beak saddles, which to me is like, wow, why would anyone do that, right? So I understand we're going, you know, outside of the Marpan project right now, but since you're working on birds and since you mentioned that that subject, I'm curious of your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, that <clears throat> is a good point. A lot of uh, all the tagging we do, we are coming at a point of it's the bird's welfare first and foremost. I mean, there's a lot of... The, the, from the beginning there's a licensing aspect um where they look at whether or not what we're actually doing <clears throat> would be of detriment to the bird and how are we going to mitigate that and then in the field we're constantly um we're monitoring their breeding success and also looking at the effect of the tag on that bird itself <clears throat> and then for certain seabirds we'll look at the potential effect of the tagging in, in the following years as well, if they if they come back again to breed, so, <clears throat> and if they we see that there's a negative impact, that's put forward back to the licensing committee for them to consider in future whether or not that type of tagging uh, should go forward. But always the tagging is sort of <clears throat> view the bird's behavior is likely to be altered by the tagging itself. Are we going to learn what we need to know about? their foraging ecology or migration. And is that is the tagging itself going to then go on to help inform, uh, <clears throat> is it going to be of greater use to potentially protect that's the whole species? So there's that, uh, there's the aspect ecologically <clears throat> is a few birds being potentially disturbed. Is, <clears throat> is that then of greater, <clears throat> Are the uh, outcomes from that uh, of greater uh, value than the a few those birds which have been disturbed, and the disturbance of the birds itself is <clears throat> try, tried to minimize as low as possible. Um, black guillemots are uh, one species which are um, susceptible to disturbance, and it's something we consider the whole time that we're in the field is make sure we're. As an example, that we're only in the colony for a certain period of time, we only target um, birds that are uh, potentially <clears throat> not going to abandon their nests. That uh, they're at a p period of their breeding that they are committed to that nest and w won't be disturbed. And also that we're not opening that bird up to potential uh, predation or something like that. Um, these are all considered considerations that a lot of time in the field season goes to make, making sure that <clears throat> we are mitigating our disturbance as much as possible. Were there any any uh, cases where you actually recapture the bird and remove the tag? For black guillemots, uh, there, we did do that in one instance um, when we were doing post-nest monitoring. But for our the black guillemots, as an example, there's been very few studies until recently of their uh, movements <clears throat> through GPS tracking, um, which is why it's sort of coming to light now that we need to get this information from marine protected areas. But the reason that there have been few studies until recently are they is because they are quite tr 
tricky to recapture and compared to other birds. Um, <clears throat> they, and they also, the tags only have a short shelf life in their battery. And also the, the attachment, um, means they fall off after potentially less than a week or up to a week. And as the, the birds can be quite, once you've caught them, they, they're quite wary of you after that. <clears throat> um, so the advent of being able to download that data from the tag using uh, ultra high frequency radio to a base station has meant we can tag the bird, leave it be completely and just download that data while the tag uh, is last for that week. And we don't need to disturb that bird again, um, <clears throat> which means we don't need to recapture the birds and uh, yeah, it reduces that disturbance and increases likelihood we're gonna see more um, uh, representative behavior from them. Gotcha. So it's not like a permanent tag; it just fall off after a while. No, and a lot of uh, the BTO is working towards making tags which um, do fall off, <laughs> and uh, bir birds aren't uh, saddled with them for their entire entirety of their lives. So specifically for gulls, um, uh, we've been sort of at the forefront of creating tags which have weaklet harness and they'll fall off after a couple of years. And black guillemots, it's inherent in their tagging method that they fall off after, it's only, they're only taped on and they fall off after a few days. To echo what Daniel was saying there, the, the regulations licensing wise are particularly strict in Britain and Ireland uh, relative to other parts of the world, not criticizing other parts of the world, but uh, it's good practice. Uh, it's, um, you know, you, you need to convince the panel that you're, what you're doing is necessary. You need to convince them that you're going to. You're very likely to collect useful data to meet your project objectives, and you're 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 and you also have to uh, convince them that you're doing something that's not going to be detrimental. And if it's any way controversial, so for example, you want to, you know, Daniel decides he wants to put a he wants more data that lasts longer, but he wants to use a harness on a black gallimard. Well, he will be dragged through the mill to convince anyone that a that's necessary and b uh, that that's not going to have an impact so we, these levels of scrutiny are terrific uh, for making sure that uh, that welfare standards are very high and uh, and that we're we're yes we very often have a modest hopefully very little behavioral impact on the birds but the the ends justify the means and the means are are very um uh, carefully thought out and managed and mitigated. So in the majority of seabirds, uh, things like harnesses are not used and it's it's uh, glue on or taped onto feathers, temporary deployments, so the birds will they'll molt their feathers. And those things are really low impact. And if you're, uh, uh, but they deliver the data we want. So it's the best, it's a win-win uh, in that respect. And, and any long, a lot of long-term deployments are little tiny, you know, one gram or less, uh, light level recorders on legs on little rings so i mean very minimal impact uh, on on mo most seabirds um uh, medium bodied on upward no this is this is important to notice that you folks are are just just on a you know high level working with a high tech you know advanced technology that transmits data and those tags are not permanent because most of the conversation that i mentioned uh, at, at the start of my question was basically plastic tags with a big number you know uh s s attached to the bird which understandably was raising some eyebrows i just wanted to ask daniel um because that, that i mean the black gallimard stuff has been has been fascinating uh, how um if you're able to say daniel how because you've done this sort of tagging work elsewhere in scotland for example uh how uh what uh, were there any very apparent differences in black guillemot um, foraging behavior from Northern Ireland. Do they do the same as elsewhere or is it very different? I was just interested in that. Could the important, uh, to correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, but you're, you're not, you weren't using time depth recorders, but you were using uh, tags with that functionality, accelerometry, am I right? So, so Tommy, this is three dimensional tracking. So not only knowing where the, where a black guillemot's going for its dinner, but knowing what it's doing from the sea surface downwards which is just terrific stuff. Yeah, so there's two things there. Were, were they behaving in a similar manner to 
Black Elmonts in Scotland and what were the sort of results of the ta- tag that we did in Northern Ireland. So from what I found was um, they were sort of behaving in a similar manner to um, uh, Scotland. <clears throat> Birds are very uh, local in their foraging. They don't stray potentially farther than five kilometers, but they're also very confined by those local um, environmental conditions, specifically the depth of the seabed. <clears throat> so what in Bangor and on uh, Lighthouse Island, we found the birds to be very constricted by depths <clears throat> shallower than 30 meters. And that reflects really well what we were finding in uh, Orkney and Caithness as well. Um, and also birds were using s- strong um, tidal currents to forage on. And additionally, we <clears throat> in uh, sort of reflection of what we found in Scotland, individual birds had uh, very spe- individual specific foraging areas that they would repeatedly return to. Um, <clears throat> and But uh, as opposed to what we were finding in Orkney, uh, we <clears throat> were able to look at a lot of uh, diurnal variation in their behavior. <clears throat> so at night, they would go off shore to a uh, navigational boy, boys to roost. Um, and also they would go, go and float or um, roost on the sea surface at night. <clears throat> uh, specifically at Bangor, we saw a lot of that activity, um, <clears throat> which is really interesting. Um, and it's worth noting because there is this diurnal variation in their in their behavior. For marine protected areas, <clears throat> it's not a huge issue because they stayed within this five kilometer range. They didn't go to to new areas to to rest at night, essentially. Um, and the second bit about that, well, yeah, this is uh, previously studies have um, tried to look at. Um, the dive depths of black gomots and link that to their forging movements. And that's been difficult because um, TDRs, uh, temperature depth recorders or t- and time depth recorders, um, have been leg mounted <clears throat> and they stay on. And then the, and they've been able to return, get the depth recorders back. But because the, they've had to recapture the birds, the GPS tags have fallen off. So they can ne- they, there's only been a couple birds that they've seen where they're diving and where they're going <clears throat> or how deep they're diving and where they're going. And so this is sort of the first time as Kendry alluded to that we've had tags, which had um, remote download of both depth data and the, their um, GPS positional data. And what we we're finding was, is it was really interesting. What we we're finding that they were um, diving to the seafloor and, uh, and, <clears throat> Uh, they were confined by seafloor depth. They've been suggested to be benthic foraging for years because of their prey types, but it's never really been shown. Um, so this is, yeah, one of the first times we've to link the locations where they're going and the depths of the dives and the, the depths of the dives matched up perfectly with the uh, profile of the seafloor. So they were foraging benthically. They're also um, foraging sort of within pelagically as well and one thing was which was interesting was we wanted to because uh, we saw this diurnal variation in their locations <clears throat> we were able to show that they're not forging at night <laughs> they're what they're diving ceased at night um and that lines up really well with uh, chick feeding studies and things where they stop um uh feeding past 10 o'clock at night and until about 5 a.m. when it gets dark. So they are really confined by light, potential light levels um, when they're fe- uh, to feed their chicks. So th- those are all sort of new findings which came out um, from the MARPEM work. Um, given that the sort of diurnal pattern of foraging appears to be um, constricted by light levels, are Tysties, black guillemots, are constricted by um, water visibility as well. If the water is very uh, murky, does that limit where they can forage? Potentially, potentially, or it might also limit um, the depth that they that they forage. They... <clears throat> so I'm only sort of 
guessing that they are limited by the light levels. I'd sort of maybe thought they might be foraging at night because of dino migration of uh, prey. And then they'd forge on sort of gadoids that'd come up to the prey, to the surface. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, sedimentation and increased uh, turbidity within the, the water column could potentially uh, reduce their foraging efficiency then. And that something um, which <clears throat> might increase with uh, the um, construction of tidal turbines, which is sort of the underlying reason I was looking at their foraging ecology in Scotland was they're building tidal turbines within the Pentland Firth. I won't go on about this because it's nothing to do with the Marpan project, but uh, one of the things that was suggest was of potential interest was the potential uh, that those turbines were going to increase turbidity within the water column and might reduce their foraging efficiency if they're visual foragers. So it is it is a consideration, yeah. And did you say, Daniel, that your the Northern Irish black guillemots were selecting areas of higher, but you used to turn better than this, but higher velocity water movement? Um, was that the more higher currents? Or was that the case? And why? Is this so I found, black yeah, they use... <clears throat> In uh, birds do use up upwellings associated with tidal streams um, and certain areas of those tidal streams, um, which might be aggregating the prey uh, within eddies. And I, the Lighthouse Island and the Copeland Islands are surrounded by really strong uh, currents that f um, flow through the the sounds, the Donaghadee Sound and the Copeland Sound. And birds were using those areas, uh, but as I found also in Scotland, only some birds were using those areas. Some birds would go to um, areas not associated with tidal currents at all, and they might be targeting, this is one of the questions that still needs answers, what prey are they bringing back from those different areas? Um, in areas where there's upwellings of prey, are they bringing back gadoids or uh, flatfish, <clears throat> or in, 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 in areas where they're going to um, kelp patches, which aren't tidally influenced, are they, what are they bringing back? Potentially butterfish. So there's still work to be done. And of uh, looking at the advantages of those different foraging are areas selected by individuals. Well, I tell you this much, if we can get this much data and this much information uh, thanks to tagging, I'm perfectly okay with a bird carrying a tag for a for a while. The, the old old TDRs. I don't know what the, these. I mean, we're moving with technology here all the time, of course, on this stuff, Tommy. But the TDRs that whenever I last used them, and the problem with them, of course, you've got to recapture your bird to get the data. But they were recording. They switched in. Uh, from recollection, they switched into a high frequency of data collection mode. So every every few centimeters, it would collect a data point. So you would get this amazing profile of a dive of a you know a razor bill or a guillemot or something like that, uh, because these clever little devices that people have made, super. This is really fantastic. What what other uh, uh, methods? What other research methods were you using other than other than tagging? Yeah, well, that's, I'm thinking apart from tags. You know, with a lot of obviously the the sophisticated modeling, like like we've been mentioning there, that that the um the statistical experts have been working on um field wise, uh, nothing terribly innovative. Uh, you extra were using drones, um, and we were trialing conservation detection dogs for burrowing seabirds, uh, and much of the rest of the stuff is basically old school binoculars and notebooks, um. Uh, which you know, let's not. That's you. You don't use anything more sophisticated than you need to, and sometimes you have no choice. Um, but uh, like on Rathlin, it was um, you know, it is telescopes where you've got you're on a hard, not moving surface, or or binoculars to count from cliff tops, and then on, um, on a from a boat, it's um a case of keeping your feet, trying not to be sick. Uh, count and write down a notebook simultaneously, which you know, if you pick your day, it's not too bad. But um, I wouldn't like to do some of that on on rough days, uh, and it's very, very um, 
the that that simple method though is just very uh very draining because you have to concentrate you have no time you can't really oh let's do that again you're always moving and the birds are always moving and it's and you're moved from one zone to another extremely intensive uh you get burnout after about six hours of that you know when you end up you know, how many birds we've counted thirty five thousand of x and twenty thousand of y in the last six hours it's full on yeah so kenji mentioned drones so Although Kenji and the field team on Rathlin, uh, we were doing it the old school way um, on boats and on land. Um, we did have one um, section of the north coast that was counted with a drone. And that was Sheep Island, which is a special production area. Um, and it's designated for cormorants. Um, and the island itself, Sheep Island, is very difficult to land on. It's quite perilous. Um, and accessing it during the breeding season can be very disturbing for the cormorants breeding there. Um, and, you know, people who, who count it regularly know this and they're very careful about um, how they do that. But a potentially um, useful way of doing this is to, to use drones, um, you know, little unmanned drones, cameras. Um, so what uh, Dave Allen, who was our um, managing that stretch of the surveys and his team did, and they got in a um, drone team called Heritage NI, and they were able to um, use their drone to photograph all of all of the island um, and, and count the cormorants from the air in that way. Um, and that was seemed to be a real success. Uh, it didn't seem to appear to worry the cormorants at all, which was really a relief, um, and almost certainly caused less disturbance than um, surveyors getting onto the island and having to, to cross the colony to do that. Um, what would be nice, I think, is if we could do both um, and try and get a bit of a comparison, maybe at lots of different sites, just to see, you know, what is the different level of disturbance in those two methods? Because, I mean, I'm sure they both have a, some some sort of impact, but um, to be able to kind of get a, a sense of, you know, their relative performance in terms of the accuracy of the count and, and performance in terms of impact on colonies would be really interesting. So I, I hope that, I'm sure there's somebody out there looking at that, but um, it would be interesting to know. Um, but yeah, we, so we did use drones in that respect. And I think there's loads of opportunity um, in Northern Ireland and further afield to use uh, camera technology for seabird monitoring. And I'd definitely like to see that more, more of that in the future. Because I mm -hmm. think it's got Did you folks flown those drones, drones yourself or did you get the, like a licensed oh, pilot? <laughs> no, professional, professional. It would be an absolute disaster if I was flying the drone, I can tell you that. No, no, like professional drone operators were doing that for us. Um, and they produce this really cool 3D model of Sheep Island that you can uh -huh. look up online as well. Um, so I recommend doing that. It's very cool. But it would be nice to be uh -huh. able to try and plot seabird nests onto that. Uh -huh. And and were there like a standard uh, uh standard drones or were there like a like a advanced drones with some extra equipment infrareds and so on and so forth? Oh well, yeah, that's beyond my knowledge. I'm afraid um, I, it wasn't anything infrared. It was just uh, visual, as far as I'm aware. Um, but I guess they're, they're, given they're professional drone operators, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a fancy one beyond my ability to afford. <laughs> Catherine, were they um were they I forgot about that, but the project has brilliant use of, of um I mean cormorants are notoriously jumpy. Uh you know, you step on that island even if even if you can get on it and you would call wreck havoc very often with cormorant colonies. So so that's that's terrific. And uh I mean drones are, are you know, operating at a hundred meters can get resolution of uh a pixel of two and a half inches. So you know, a cormorant or an egg or a nest is, uh, you know, well, the, the nest patches will be very obvious. So, um, Catherine, what I was going to ask was, what, what, did they did they launch the drone from the mainland or from a boat? From the boat. So they were, we were really lucky for the North Coast surveys that um, AFB's fisheries patrol vessel was able to provide um, Dave and Dennis with um a platform from which to do the counts but they they did take uh, the drone onto the boat and flew it from there because there's only a certain um, space that you can use it from so that was really helpful they were able to to use the boat to get close to sheep island and then use the drone from there so, yeah that's good that's where we were saying uh, we were saying the other day with Stuart, uh where the professional drone operator and the amateur come into their own or the differences come into their own because you're when you say come home to the drone it comes home but your home has moved you've drifted on the tide by 10 meters and 
And I think they, I believe they had calamitous moments in the Hebrides were trying to land, which was only a DJS, quite a small DJI um, drone um, by, um, well, I think they managed to do it safely, but um, it's a, you know, when you say home, it's not like it's going to land in the sea 10 metres to where you were half an hour Yikes. ago. Yikes. <laughs> you were you were you were pushing I mean, capabilities of those drones I, I, clearly. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, but uh, but uh, I mean, a pro operator, you know, was no problem bringing it down to mm. exactly above you. I've tended now to with the same sort of drone to to do something slightly dodgy, which is just to where um where the substrate that I'm standing on could damage the rotors. I just reach underneath and grab it by hand, <laughs> which you definitely couldn't do with a big a big one. <laughs> oh man. This is good, uh, folks. Listen, I have a question. Like, how do you, uh, how do you, trying to determine impacts of climate change on on seabirds? What 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 methods you're using to do that? It was kind of a stu- two stage process with lot five of Marpam, uh, beginning with the literature review, which was first to use all that, <clears throat> combine all that research that had already taken place within the United Kingdom and uh, Ireland and just in North Atlantic um, to identify what was affecting <clears throat> through climate, what, how climate change was affecting seabirds <clears throat> and the mechanisms by which climate change at its base reaches all the way up to affect seabird productivity, phenology <clears throat> and survival. And yeah, so <clears throat> to, so we reviewed the literature picking out, um, what the environmental variables were, <clears throat> which were generally found to be uh, sea surface temperature and the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which is a pressure variable um, between Iceland and the Azores and uh, positive North Atlantic Oscillation Index values are sort of related to really strong uh, pressure gradient between Iceland and Azores and uh, wet and stormy conditions, wet, warm and stormy conditions, and the negative NAO is related to cold and dry uh, conditions within the northern Europe. <clears throat> um, so the, those are the two main variables that were picked out from the literature review. And then you, then we examined how the environmental variables then have a knock-on influence on their productivity and populations and um, phenology and survival and that was generally found it varied between s- species those impacts <clears throat> um, for a number of reasons uh, based on their foraging behavior with how do they forage on the sea surface <clears throat> did they dive for their prey also their nesting behavior um, did they nest on low um, flat areas or on exposed cliffs <clears throat> or in sheltered areas uh, and how far they went to forage did they forage uh, offshore or did they stay like a black gilmot and shags do they stay near the colony when they're foraging um, <clears throat> and so all those and what actually do they forage on what are their main prey types and all those impacts <clears throat> would influence how those birds react to fluctuations in sea surface temperature and the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and that, um, and what was really found was the indirect impacts um, through prey were having the greatest, <clears throat> uh, where climate change had a greatest impact on seabird demography through those indirect mm. impacts, which were channeled up through the trophic levels. Um, see, for example, high sea surface temperature influencing the copepod uh, composition of the diet or the abundance of those copepods through <clears throat> and the strength of a spring bloom and then how that would influence the abundance of the prey <clears throat> and then with knock-on infl- impacts on the breeding sets of of the birds and also the um, condition of the adults coming into the breeding season following uh, winter out at sea and how those foraging conditions were out at sea. And 
we found, yeah, climate change had a spatial variation, but also a species variation on those through the literature. We found this <clears throat> that birds, which um, were longer range foragers, were more influenced by uh, uh, stormy conditions and <clears throat> went went out at sea, went out in the North Atlantic during the winter, um, and their which would influence their ability to to forage and prey availability. <clears throat> so they would enter into the breeding season in a poor condition. And then mm. during that breeding season, the uh, prey availability would then influence their breeding success. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, seabirds, which were more local, like such as a shag, they uh, were more influenced by the local conditions and um, specifically the sea surface temperature. So for shags, when sea surface temperature was high, uh, that would mean that <clears throat> um, potentially sand eel populations were less uh, available and less abundant and of lower quality, and they would increase the diversity of their diet. But also those <clears throat> uh, higher temperatures might also come with... Uh, positive uh, North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which would increase storminess, which would then have a direct impact on them through um, uh, affecting their, because they're, they're waterproofing and their ability to dry out between periods of storms and mm. the greater frequency of storms means there's a higher temperature stress occurring on those birds. So we identify that there's indirect impacts coming up through the Trophic, uh, through the trophic levels, but also the, there's these direct impacts which are less studied um, but potentially and don't have as great an influence but are predicted to increase with greater vari greater variation in weather uh, and weather anomalies w related to climate change itself. And <clears throat> that then led on to uh, inform what Jacob did which I'll now pass over to him <laughs> thanks that's really handy yeah so I, I was able to well, I, I could go over how we have evaluated uh, climate change vulnerability based on what Daniel was talking about and, and other um, bits of information so um, what we want what we want to do when we're assessing climate change vulnerability is estimate the likely threat of a climate risk uh, related decline and also look at the likely benefit um, for potential expansion so some or you know or um, or just general benefits from climate change so um, either could be possible for any species so just just as an example you take into account whether the species is already declining in abundance whether that decline is linked um, to climate change so um, for that second element, we'd use the information that, that Daniel found. So looking at these mechanisms for um, um, for the effect of climate change on species. And then we would look at whether the species is projected to decline in abundance as a result of climate change. So that's where my work came in. So this is taking species abundance data from the last two censuses, or uh, well, the last two complete censuses, and that another census seabirds count is uh, either nearly complete or um, pretty much complete but the data is being collated um, so I took that and then related that to observed climate data um, using statistical models and then taking that fitted relationship projected seabird abundance into the future for a future climate in 2050 under a, a kind of business as usual uh, emission scenario um, and then look at the um, the change, the projected change in abundance for each of these species. So we started with 25 species, but there was only really enough data or the models fit nicely enough to make projections for 19 of those species. And uh, those overall, I start by saying there's quite a lot of uncertainty in our projections. So it's quite hard to fit a relationship between seabird abundance and climate because you know, as, as you know, seabird colonies are really, you know, highly aggregated. So you might have 
tens of thousands of birds at one site and then you go 600 meters down the coast and there's none and it's quite hard to explain that according to a variable that varies as gradually as sea surface temperature or you know breeding season maximum temperature so we know that climate affects the birds but it's actually quite hard to match that up statistically so we did made various kind of sophisticated uh, innovations to try and uh, deal with that um but but still there's, there's quite a lot of uncertainty in the relationship but overall we're projecting that the majority of species um that we looked at will decline by 2050 for these seabird species so um yeah so in summary and, and some of those are expected to decline quite significantly so um seven of those species are predicted to decline by more than 50 percent I suppose the headline one is Arctic skew, which we're predicting to go extinct um, in the UK and Ireland by 2050, um, as other studies have done. Um, the other species are storm pe- well, to decline more than 50% are storm petrel, puffin, arctic tern, sandwich tern and little tern. There's a bit of a caveat to some of those because a couple of those species, the model didn't fit so well and so we're less, uh, less confident in those. Um, and then another seven species we're predicting to decline by less than 50 percent and then but but it's not all bad news so there's a for five of the species we're predicting that they'll increase um under climate change um by 2050 so that's greater black bat gull common tern uh shag black-headed gull and lesser black bat gull um and so we we took those predicted declines um, combined them with our information on the whether the decline is linked to climate change, whether the species is already declining in abundance, and then combine that to assess the vulnerability of species to climate change. So this is the, the information that we're really giving to managers to let them, you know, apportion their conservation uh, effort and resources because conservation is very resource <laughs> limited um, uh, field. So there's only so much money and time to spend on various species. So we found 11 species with uh, high vulnerability, four species with moderate vulnerability and four species with the opportunity to increase. And then there's another, one species, shag, was a bit of a strange one. So that we're projecting that that will increase under climate change. But then under, you know, because of the, um, uh, as Daniel mentioned, with this this issue with storminess and the waterproofing of the feathers or the lack of waterproofing of the feathers and the birds potentially getting wetted in, in storms, um, there's also the opportunity for them to be really badly affected by climate change. So that was one that we'd assess as mixed vulnerability. So as ever, these things are not very clear cut. But it, it's interesting to relate it, relate this back to um what Catherine's been working on with the, you know, pulling out these the recent figures for Northern Ireland in terms of how how seabirds have changed uh, in recent times, because sometimes we'll see that the the projections or the that seabirds are already changing in the in the way that we might expect with climate change, but sometimes they're not. So it may be that a our our projections are not that accurate. It's possible. Uh, it may be that it may be that other factors are much more important. So changes in food supply that are not related to climate change. So not you know not related to this kind of bottom up zooplankton sand eels um, um, pathway that that's been really highlighted that Daniel talked about. It may be to do with fisheries and 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 other other aspects bycatch. Um, so climate change is, is potentially only one of several things that are really affecting seabirds at the moment but there's another thing in that um quite often seabirds have a kind of hump shaped relationship with say temperature so this has been found in um let's say in 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 puffins in iceland was a really interesting recent study where where the, the the sign of the relationship between um puffin or puffin productivity and temperature changed over time depending on what the temperature was so it may be that for some species we'll see them increasing um, over the next decade or so and then and only then start to decline in 
from 2040, 2050 onwards. So our, our projections are for 2050. So it may be that birds change in the opposite direction to um, uh, what we're predicting uh, initially and then and then move the other way. So, um, yeah, so I, I, what we predict doesn't always accord with what we see so far. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, okay, folks, uh, we're going to be wrapping this up. It's it's incredibly fascinating, um, and and we already we already an, over an hour in. Uh, I just want to finish that off with a question: that if you were if you were given a power um, to do one thing for protecting um, seabirds, and you know. Um, reversing the negative trends that we talked about what that would be uh, i think one of the really um important factors that influence seabirds uh in the uk and around the world um i mean this is a real global problem is invasive predators um and so if i could do one thing for seabirds globally it would be to re- get rid of all invasive predators all over the world in the click of the fingers because i think that would do seabirds a lot of good <laughs> that's very interesting and and you think this is the biggest impact those invasive predators well it's certainly probably i would say it was probably the most ubiquitous one um so some of the negative trends that we see on rathin island for example um might be due to the fact that rathin has a population of rats and ferrets that was introduced um well or managed to get there accidentally um and the rspb have a project, a life project currently to try and get rid of rats and ferrets on the island. And I think that will be really beneficial. But, um, and, you know, this is a problem for seabirds all over the world. Um, in remote places, they're not often well adapted to deal with um, mammalian predators, particularly um, being often ground nesting and um, don't have that much in the way of defense against predation. So, as, as well as climate change, which is obviously something that we've been talking a lot about today. Um, yeah, invasive predators are a big problem for seabirds and, and something that can be quite difficult to deal with. Well, I would say that I'm firstly not so much of a seabird biologist as my um, my colleagues here, but I think I would give the rather boring answer that so a lot pick, of this so pick, just... so pick one that you're more more comfortable with, you know, like what, what would be the one thing for the area that you that you work on and see the negative impacts like a declines in 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 uh, abundance and so on what would, would you do i think i think so i think for me this just reaffirms the importance um of the fact that we really need to deal with climate change um as quickly as possible and as um you know uh, as effectively as possible and mitigate the impact so i suppose well i can relate this to one of the um uh, outputs that came from this work, which was the adaptation report, which is a really interesting report that, that people can go and read on the website. And that talks about the different ways that we can help species adapt to climate change. So you've got these kind of um, direct counteracting adaptations. So for example, if we're expecting sea level to rise and and swamp, um, say, turn nests and um, close to the sea, etc., then we can help um, give them more habitat by um helping the the you know having managed realignment and and staying um stabilizing dunes etc um but really we, we also really need to be um you know, dealing with climate change so that there's there's just less of a threat altogether because the magnitude of some of these declines that we're expecting is is really massive and we're going to see if, if what we predict is true we're going to see very different cliffs and and uh, coastal areas um, in in say fifty years time. One thing I would potentially do <clears throat> to support seabirds during or through climate change would be to try and mitigate all the other impacts that are happening to them, as well as trying to reduce the the uh, trajectory of climate change itself. Catherine already pointed out. Uh, invasive predators are um, an issue f- for seabirds and potentially disproportionately would affect seabirds compared to the impacts of changes in prey from climate change. Uh, we should also take into account the prey that seabirds 
forage on and increase our understanding of what those prey types are. <clears throat> a lot of the work <clears throat> from Mar Pam highlighted that we don't really know what their diet is um, within the interreg 5A region for a lot of seabirds, and we don't know how that prey fluctuates and how it's shifting <clears throat> with climate change. So getting a better grasp of that prey and then understanding what might impact that prey itself uh, potentially through fisheries and things that we could mitigate through better fisheries management um, using an ecosystem-based approach when considering fisheries management um, by looking at how fisheries themselves have a knock-on effect to seabirds <clears throat> and ensuring that those fish stocks aren't negatively influenced by our fisheries as well as a cumulative impacts from climate change, fisheries, uh, um, predator disturbance, is trying to <clears throat> pick out what those threads are and um, mitigate where we can. All right, uh, folks, thanks a lot. It was it was really enlightening and uh, uh, I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners and viewers learn a lot. So thanks a lot. Thanks very much, it's been really interesting. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, Tommy.